All right, we're we're crossing live to London to the voice of cycling, Phil Liggett. You join us from looks like a mix of the Shawshank Redemption and a commentary booth. Uh, <laughs> how's life going over there, mate? I'll tell you, it's going terrific. It's gone a far better than we ever anticipated. I really thought the first of all the tour wouldn't get going at all, uh, but not only has it got going, I'm actually working from Sky Television, just west of London, by London Airport, and. Um, so far, so good. My co-commentator is on the other side of the Atlantic, 8,000 kilometres away, and yet we're talking without any time delay to each other, and everybody thinks we're sat alongside each other. So, <laughs> um, How's the reception been? Obviously, it's a big day in Australia with Adam Yates taking the yellow jersey, but what, what's the reception been like in his hometown of uh, Britain? Well, I would imagine very good, but, you know, this is all happens to me overnight. I was driving away uh, in my car going home because I'm staying at home every night, and the telephone rang from the producer in the States telling me that uh, that they just penalised you in Alaphilippe. Um, and I thought, wow. Then I heard a few of the comments uh, from uh, Adam and from Julia. Uh, Adam doesn't want to take the lead this way, obviously. He was told... He just had his shower in the team bus. He was about to drive away in the team bus. And Matt White got a phone call from the organisation saying, hey, we need your rider here. He's in the lead of the Tour de France because they've just penalised Julian Alfie for taking a drink. And so he had to get out back in his gear and get onto the start line for the presentation. But um, I found out only those words. And like you, I've been learning all throughout the, last night. Um, you've had a day to think about it, but I've only just come into work. <laughs> I'm working on it now because we go on air in uh, America at uh, 11 o'clock English time. But, of course, that is 6 o'clock in the morning in the state. So it's quite an early start for the boys over yeah. there. You got one for Phil Liffey? I certainly have, mate. Yeah, well, look, uh, I thought it was fascinating. Um, as I was watching the vision, I saw him go over to the side to grab uh, and grab a bottle. I thought, that's inside 20K to go. That, straight away, I thought of that. Yeah. It turns out mm -hmm. it was his cousin, who's his coach, who, who gave him the bottle. Well, I think you can you can forgive Alaphilippe for not realising he's inside 20K because there is a big banner on the road. But if you're locked in the pack, you're concentrating, you can miss that. Uh, yeah. But the coach should have known better. Uh, and this year, the referees have already shown us that they intend to pursue the rules that often they let slip by. Because from day one, they form barrages when riders have fallen or crashed. So they've got to cross the void back to the peloton using their own energy. Uh, only at the start yesterday, they issued an overnight communique at warning the riders for the image of cycling that they must, if they have a mechanical or a flat tyre, they must not return to the peloton behind a team car. In other words, that the team cars must return to the file behind the pack and the rider must come to them and then work his way through the cars into the pack. So it, it goes stands to reason the same guys are running the show this year and the referees change every year. Uh, they, then they decided to apply the drinking rule as well because there was three riders, I believe. It wasn't just Julian, but Julian, of course, was in yellow. They were correct to apply the rule. It's plain for all to see. And you're right, it was his cousin Frank uh, who's just joined the team. It might be his last job if he keeps this up uh, because um, that's caused the disqualification <laughs> from the leadership. Happily, not from the race. Uh, some fascinating insights there from the voice of cycling. Uh, we've, we're getting some questions that are coming in as well. If he, uh, one from Scott Davies, he says, uh, what do you think will happen with broadcasting from next year? Will the commentators be on the ground or always remote? I, I think this is going to be a common issue or solution for however you look at it with companies across the world because even back here in Melbourne, you know, a lot of um, companies that had offices in the CBD and now people are working from home and they're still uh, able to remain efficient and it's not costing them as much money, it's going to be a no-brainer. So you will actually probably see a lot more um, telecasts happening remotely, particularly if they go off without a, a hitch. But as you know, if you, there's nothing quite like being there on the ground like even for us, you know, we can dial in and do things like that, but it doesn't beat being there on the ground in person and then, you know, you can do follow-up questions, you can read the mood better. Um, it's not quite the same, is it? No, it's not the same. I don't I, – look, I, 
I think differently to you. Although I agree, a lot of businesses will be doing that in the future. It's working out better for them. I don't think that's the case here. I think Tour de France, the commentators will try to be there because it's it's not just about what you're commentating the event. You can actually do that exactly the same. It's all the information you get. It's just the feeling you're talking with riders. No, this year you couldn't do that. But you, you, you're talking with managers and all the, the chit-chat that goes on around, you, you, you feel more a part of it. Yeah, but a lot of those commentators, if he will openly say, they don't mix with the teams, they don't mix with the staff and all that sort of stuff. They are literally at the finish line, they pack it up, they go to a hotel, they go to the finish the next day. You don't get to see the course and the wind direction or whatever, but um, I still think they're going to look at the costs and say, well, if we can save a, a couple of million bucks like from the telecast for someone like an NBC, they're, they're probably going to look at it, aren't they? They'll look at it, but uh, I can tell you the people like the Phil Liggetts, the people like the Matty Keenans, Robin McEwens, they want to be there. It's not, I don't. I wasn't trying to say that they mix with the actual athletes, but they they you know chatting with them. It's different when you're thousands of kilometres away. You feel removed. You're just yeah. driving the course. They drive the course late at night, but they're still driving it. They're yeah. there in the morning. They're looking at the wind direction. They feel like they're. In France. And, and then you've also got the option to do the uh, stand-up intros and outros on location. That always looks better for the telecast rather than a green screen. Um, here's part two. So we've got Phil's chat into four parts because of the technology only allows us up to five minutes. Uh, part two, you were talking a little bit more detail about the Tour de France rules. John Dickencobb, who was just outside the time limit, crashed yeah. uh, on day yes. one and, and they threw him out. Normally they would have been a little bit lenient for, because of the situation, the terrible conditions, but no, he was out. So they're, they're obviously not changing any rules this year. Well, you're right, John. That's another point in question, yes, because if you could cast your mind back to the 80s when Paul Sherwin rode the Tour de France, he had a terrible crash one kilometre after the start of a stage going a long way to Pontalier. The team waited for him. After a few kilometres, he said to the team, I'm really hurting. Get back in the race. You'll get eliminated. So they all went back to the pack. He was left to ride the whole stage on his own. He came in well outside the time limit. But because of the courage he showed, the organisers, having kicked him out, the chief referee of the day was a guy called Wim Jeremias, who was a Dutchman. And he went to the organisation and said, I'm the boss of the tour and I'm putting the English rider back in because he's shown such courage. And and that should have been the case with John Deckencold, in all, all honesty. He was only a few minutes outside the time limit. He wasn't going to start next day anyway. And, uh, and as Philippe Gilbert said, his teammate, he should have appeared in the results of that opening stage and then retired next morning because that's what would have happened. As it was, he was classified as being eliminated from the Tour de France. That was a tough call, I think, and not, not a good one. But I think the Alaphilippe one you can't argue with. Um, I was going to say, Phil, the GC battle's about to really fire up and it looks like Visma, um, uh, you know, taking favouritism at this point. Do you think they've got what it takes to, to roll Ineos and Bernal and, and, and the likes? Well, Visma have been firing like this right through the new season since it started on August the 1st. And I thought they're overdoing this. We know Roglic had that crash which took him out of the Dauphiné on the last day when he was winning the race and uh, and he doesn't he said he wasn't recovering as fast as he liked but he was coming to the tour his partner was actually saying that uh, she felt he wouldn't start the tour so we begin to think hey this guy might be really injured I think he showed us he's not injured with that fine he had at Orsier Mallet uh, but uh, the team itself is starting to click again and the, the winner yesterday Van Ert, I mean this guy was was almost a dead man a year to go in the Tour de France. It took him a year to recover, and now he's winning again. So I think it is the team to beat. I can see a different strategy coming out of Ineos this year. They're, they were brilliant yesterday towards the end. They hurt the race in the last 20k. They really drove that race, and they got rid of a lot of riders. So they're getting they're moving in much slower, keeping a lower profile, and I'm sure it's because of Jum, Jumbo Visma. Um, I think we're going to see a great race. I really do. I, I said that before the race started. And I'm even more sure now. And it's a bad day today. Tough climb. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted to really talk about today's uh, stage, mate, because um, 
it is going to be a ripper when you when you realise you don't. Adam's got four seconds on on the red hot ra- ra- race for Roglic, but there's another twenty riders inside one minute, so it's really up for grabs on a very very hard finish. Yeah, it is, and it's it's the actual finish line is not part of the King of the Mountains yet. It's the highest spot of the tour of the day, of the stage of the day, uh, but the climb itself, which is some eight kilometres, herpins, it's not very good road. There's a possibility of rain up there. It's the wettest part of France. Uh, and it's the only place with a meteorological station which is still manned uh, 24-7 every day of the year, um, which is unusual in itself. So we'll see what sort of weather they get. I, I'm going to stand behind Philippe, Ala Philippe, to, to get his own back and try and win the stage. But this particular climb, never been used in the Tour de France ever before, has been used in other races like the Midi Lieb. And in fact, when Bernard Eno in his heyday came onto this climb in a small race, he actually got off and walked it. So, well, you know, a class of Eno walk climb. (laughs) We're going to see what happened, but it could strengthen the the people like uh, Pogaccia. I think this kid is absolute pure magic. And I think he's going to put a a great show in. He's Slovenian as well, like Roglic. I mean, second the other day, Ossia Malet. When we've never had uh, two riders from the same country of Slovakia, Slovenia, sorry, uh, finished one two on a stage. So I think we'll see a battle royale. And I think uh, Adam Yates, having been catapulted into the yellow jersey, which he didn't really want, because he's, he's not, he's said all along he's not aiming to win the tour. He wanted to lose a bit of time to take stages. And he was planning to attack today to try and get the stage win. Now he'd be a marked man. So we'll have to wait and see if he can win the stage today. But that was his original plan, was to win the stage today. Um, it was interesting, uh, Phil's pronunciation of, uh, I thought it was Pogacar. But he calls him Pogacar. <laughs> Go get so, you. <laughs> yeah, who's going to argue with the voice of cycling? Now, um, we were talking before about working from home and you were very much in the camp. You need to be on the ground. Dave Adderley makes a good point. You can't work from home with Iffy's internet. <laughs> so I don't think you're going to be able to cover the tour from uh, Geelong, mate. Um, now, this is part three of our grab with uh, Phil. I think we were trying to rev him up about um, getting some extra cash. Now, all reports from Sam uh, Yates has come onto the bus with his headphones. He's just fully in the zone and exactly that. I, he, he thinks that he's, he's going to go close to winning the stage. Now, I want to ask one final question for me, Phil, and that is these record numbers they're saying from NBC, which C is it? Is it because of COVID or the commentary? Uh, well, it's definitely the commentary. I, I was into it. I, I, the poor guys in America, they're getting into the office every day at 3.30 a.m. because they start their shows going out at 6 this morning, their time. Uh, um, if you live on the west coast of America, the poor people in there, they're, they're watching the start of the Tour de France at 4 a.m. Uh, but our figures are coming through and they're, they're promising to say the least. And I must confess that the uh, I feel as though I'm sat next door to Bob Rowe, my co-commentator. Uh, the only thing is, unlike when I used to sit with Paul Shearer, and I can't grab Bob Rowe's knee. Uh, <laughs> but we do see each other. We have a spy camera. Somebody you can see it, but you can probably, can you see that television? Stuff? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Bob's spy cam. He's not there, of course. His room's empty. Uh, and I'm on the other one. So we, they're watching all the time what we're doing, but we, they can't put us into vision to the state because of technical problems. It's, it's very similar here with um, with Matty Keane and, uh, and Robin McEwen. They're, one's in Sydney, one's in Melbourne. But they, you, you would ha- it's very seamless. They're doing it well. But is it like is it like Phil with NBC shows? Like if shows go to number one, all the actors and that, they get a bonus or whatever. Do they sling you a bit of extra coin if you hit a certain number? Uh, look, I am paid so much money to do this job. They couldn't possibly increase it at all. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, now I don't have to stay in a hotel. I have a driver take me home and bring me every day. Um, I just hope it doesn't catch on. I might never see fans. <laughs> Phil, you commentate on the Bakery every every year, so it shows that you don't commentate for the money, mate. <laughs> it's about that 1985 job, John. You never did pay me. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right mate I'll double, I'll double your pay when you come back uh, uh, 
Oh, next year. And, and I, I, we, we, we're, we're close to uh, being able to announce that the Bay Crits might be back. I think uh, we could survive the, the whole COVID thing with wow. the meetings going on at the moment, but hopefully it's all good. All right. We've got one more part with Phil, and uh, that's when you were talking about how many Aussies I think were in the race. This year, we've only got two Australians uh, in in the Tour de France, which yeah. is uh, the least since uh, uh, for, for eighteen years. But um, you've only got two or three Americans as well this year. It's it's amazing. Um, and same with the British. We've got a British team in the race, like Michelin Scott's an Aussie team. You've only got one rider representing the country of the of the team sponsorship, which is the way life is. Which is a big international race. Colombia have a record entry of ten riders because these kids are just going to the top of the pile in in cycle racing right now. No, we've only got uh, we've got four British riders, including two newcomers. Uh, you guys have got, I think, is it three, three Aussies, isn't it? Two, two Aussies, two Aussies, and. When did the last time that the Kiwis beat the Aussies in entry number into the Tour de France? I don't think ever. And they've got three riders in this year. Yep. Here you go. There you All go. right. Before we let you go, Phil, who's your prediction for the stage? Uh, Do you think Yatesy can win in yellow? I've picked two winners out of the stages so far. So I'm, I think I'm either second or leading. We have a competition on television every day for America. And uh, I picked Rogers' win. I picked uh, Caleb Ewan's win. Uh, and I, I've gone for Alaphilippe to get his own back today. I think he'll. Uh, I think he's taken the decision like a gentleman because he knew he knew, when he pointed out he knew he'd done wrong. No argument. He said, "Okay, another day tomorrow." Uh, but I, I, I'm pretty sure he'll try and win today. What's the cutoff with bottles on a mountain stage? I think it's the last five k, isn't it? But I think is they you... can them later. Yes, but they they do announce it when the race is underway. But uh, yes, on the climbs, I think they're allowed to take those bottles. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but it's, I think the rule goes there's twenty k still, and then they'll adjust it if they believe it's it, it's required. Okay. Well, it's after the first fifty k and before the last twenty k, you can mm. you can go back and feed. The thing is, if he'd have been that desperately thirsty, he could have asked a mate to go and get the bottle and pass yeah. it. In the pack, he yeah. wouldn't got penalised. His mate didn't wouldn't give a a monkey's a uncle about any second. So he would have kept his jersey. Yeah. Mm. Oh well, it's uh, fallen in the hands for the team, and uh, you know Jerry Ryan very well. Um, he'd be That's having a, a nice Mitchelton watching the the race tonight for sure. Oh I just wish I was with the team right now. All that Mitchelton wine going down. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, by the way, and you probably don't know it, but this is only the ninth British rider ever uh, to wear the Maillot Jaune in, a, in, a, in any Tour de France, which is fantastic. Oh, good stuff. Well, All thanks right, for joining us, Phil. You're an absolute legend, mate, and keep skyrocketing those numbers for NBC, and I'm sure they'll sling you a little bonus at the end of the tour. They have to, mate. No, they won't. They won't. <laughs> 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 And I've even got last year's NBC shirt on. I didn't get my usual stock of some 25 uh, polo necks this year. Oh, jeez. It's all downhill from now on, mate. <laughs> Cutbacks. <laughs> it's like the Bakerits. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you those at home. Yeah. <laughs> you, always oh, get to, you always get a fresh shirt at the uh, – <laughs> I was going to say the Mitchell of Bakerits. It's now Lexus yeah. of Blackbird Bakerits. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're very nice shirts, I might add. I wear them a lot especially when I'm doing the garden. <laughs> Good stuff, mate. There's been a lot of gardening being done this year as well. I don't think you've done the de France in July. Yeah. Yeah. Good on you, mate. Okay. Love to speak to you guys. Have a good day. Or good you. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Phil. Cheers, mate. You know what's funny watching that back is how many times I tried to wrap up the grab at the end. I think I said about six times, thanks, mate. Yeah, because oh, I thought he had, he was busy and had to go, but um, he loves a chat, Phil. And you know what's amazing with Phil is um, you've seen you know what he's like in person and when he's at these events is how good is Phil with the fans, like when people want to come up and talk to him. Oh, look, he, he, he does love it. And I saw uh, jumping up on uh, Facebook today uh, the first uh, snippets uh, talking about the new movie, the Phil Liggett uh, movie yes. coming out at the end of the year. So that should be a ripper. I think it's premiering at the uh, Adelaide Film Festival. So, yeah, can't wait for the release of that.